Well, thank you, Michael, and uh, thank you, music team, for leading us in some great songs there this morning. It's uh, fun to sing those songs and prepare our hearts for the Word of God this morning. And uh, this morning, we're excited to be in a study that's in the Gospel of Mark. And so I'd ask you to turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 1, please. Mark chapter 1, and the passage that we'll be looking at this morning is verses 9 through 14. So Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 14. And I'd ask you to stand with me, please, as we uh, look at this passage of Scripture this morning. Remember last week we looked at John and John the baptizer came and proclaimed a uh, baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins there in verse 4. This morning we're going to be introduced to Jesus as he is going to come out of uh, Nazareth and come down to uh, the place where John is baptizing. And we pick this up here in verse 9. In those days Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Immediately coming up out of the water, he saw the hope heavens opening and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. And a voice came out from the heavens, you are my beloved son and you I am well pleased. And immediately the spirit impelled him to go out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts and the angels were ministering to him. Now after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Let's pray, shall we? God, we just come before you this morning, and we're thankful uh, for the words here recorded in the gospel of Mark. Father, may you speak to our hearts from your word as we're introduced to Jesus, the Son of God. Help us, Father, to understand the significance of the ministry of Jesus, that we might be able to understand this passage best. Help us, Lord, today to open our hearts and our, our minds to the Spirit of the Lord as you deal with our innermost thoughts and hearts. May you receive glory by decisions that we make because of time spent with the Word of God. We thank you, Father, for being here with us today. May you be blessed and glorified in all things, for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As we come to the Gospel of Mark, we mentioned that Mark is a little bit different than the other Gospels. Uh, for we would understand in the Gospel of Mark, Mark is most concise. It's also one of the more chronological ones. Because Mark is more concise, and the fact that you can sit down and read it in less than an hour, uh, Mark has basically taken a different approach than the other Gospel writers. For instance, this morning as we consider the baptism and the temptation of Jesus Christ, we are going to be looking at things from a bigger picture. In other words, if you were to take a lens, and maybe in a camera where you have a zoom lens, and you're looking at a very small portion of Scripture, and in this situation it would be, for instance, the baptism of Jesus, you might have that all zoomed right in. But what Mark does is Mark turns the lens, and he begins to look at the bigger picture. And he sees more than just the baptism, more than just the testing in the wilderness. He sees a bigger picture with a slightly different emphasis. And that's where we find ourselves this morning, trying to look at this passage, verses 9 through 14, and understand the emphasis that God has that comes from this passage of Scripture. Now I'm looking at this passage of Scripture, and I'm suggesting uh, that in this passage of Scripture, we're seeing Jesus Christ, who is introduced to us in verse 1 as the Son of God. We're seeing him be certified. We're seeing him being certified by God the Father, and we're seeing it happen right before our very eyes. Now, if you look through that passage of Scripture that I just read, you can look for the word certified, and you probably are not going to find it. I'll just give you the heads up. But let me just say this about the word certify. It means to attest or confirm in a formal statement. Here are the, some of the synonyms for the word uh, to certify. One is verify or guarantee, attest, validate, confirm, substantiate, or endorse. The idea here is that Jesus is coming now out of Nazareth, out of Galilee, from this town of Nazareth, and he's coming down 
to meet the group that is being baptized by John. Now, here's the important point that I want you to stop and consider. I want you to put yourself back into John's day. Are you with me? We're standing near the Jordan River. That's where John is baptizing. He's down towards the southern end of the Jordan River, down towards Jericho, down towards the Dead Sea area more so. And while we're there, there are a lot of people who are coming to follow uh, the preaching of John. Now, John is preaching, and he's preaching hard. He is preaching hard. He's, he, he's re- preaching a message of repentance. He's calling on the people to repent of their sins. And then based upon the repentance of their sins, he is baptizing them. And he is baptizing them uh, in a way that shows internally their repentance. The baptism itself, as in the case of any baptism, is never washing away sin. But it was significant because it was declaring that there had been repentance that has taken part of a person's heart and that there's a new attitude, a new mindset that they have. And so John is doing this baptism. You imagine yourself on the banks of the Jordan River. Maybe you've just been baptized. Uh, maybe uh, you've already been baptized. I'm sure the crowd is there. And even though you've been baptized, you're there to hear the preaching of John. John is just ripping the cover off the ball. You know what I mean? He is just preaching hard against sin, and you're there, and you're hearing it, and you're drawing it in, and it's absolutely phenomenal. And here comes a man walking down this dusty path, coming out of Nazareth. And John looks at him and says, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He's the one that I was telling you all about. He's the one I can't even tie his sandal because I'm not worthy. I'm just standing there. You're just standing there too right? We're imagining this. We're not crazy. We're just imagining. Well, we might be doing both, but that's beside the point. We're looking at it and we're saying to ourselves, you know what? Why does he think that that's the Messiah? Why does he believe that this is the anointed one? You're going to have to show me something here so that I'll put my faith in this one who has come out of Nazareth. You see, all of these people who have been baptized, they're, they're, they're waiting for the anointed one. It's true, but, but this just doesn't seem like a very likely way that this person walking down this dusty trail happens to be the Messiah. Are you with me? There are serious questions that need to be answered. In other words, what we need to see is some way to validate, some way to certify that this man, Jesus, who's come out of Nazareth, is truly who John thinks he is. Is he truly the son of God? As he would come to John, notice here in our passage in verse uh, 9, it simply tells us there that in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth and Galilee and was baptized by John. It's very cut and dried. Remember, John's looking at something bigger. He's looking at a, a bigger picture. And I would submit to you this morning that the bigger picture that John is looking at is he's looking at this one who has come out of Nazareth and he wants to paint the picture to say that this one is certified by God. He's been validated, affirmed, approved by God Almighty, God the Father, and it is demonstrated in certain ways. He is also the sinless Savior of the world, as will be demonstrated in a moment, and he is the proclaimer of the good news. In fact, he is the object of our faith. That's a pretty tall order to certify that, isn't it? How are you going to do that? Well, the Bible tells us very simply, in those days Jesus came and he was baptized by John. Now, Matthew would tell us a little bit further that there was quite a bit of discussion over this. For when Jesus came down and he wanted to be baptized by John, John said, there is absolutely No way that I'm going to baptize you, Jesus. You need to be baptizing me. I am not the one to baptize you. And Jesus insists. And actually the wording there in the original uh, over in Matthew as it talks about John persisting. John kept insisting and persisting that no way am I going to baptize you, Jesus. This was not an easy discussion. This was a back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So there are two groups or two individuals, however you want to slice it, there are a couple of people that John wouldn't baptize. 
He's saying, no, no, Jesus, I'm not going to baptize you because I'm not worthy to baptize you. And the Sadducees and the Pharisees who had come to John for baptism, do you remember what we said last week as we read the book of Matthew in chapter three? John calls them a brood of vipers. And he says, listen, who warned you to flee of the wrath to come? And he refused to baptize them. He refused to baptize them because they were not truly repentant. In fact, chapter 3 would say, show me fruits of repentance. You were just there to be part of something bigger so that the people could be identified with and you could gain favor in their sight. That's the only reason you were there willing to do this. John comes to Jesus and says, I'm not going to baptize you either. But it's for the exact opposite reason that he would not baptize the Sadducees and the Pharisees. It was the opposite reason. They weren't spiritually ready to declare truly what has happened in their heart is that there's repentance, and Jesus doesn't need repentance. He has not sinned. He is the sinless Savior of the world. He does not need to be baptized with a repentance that leads to forgiveness of sin. Not at all. So for various reasons, John did not want to baptize Jesus. You might ask the obvious question here, because the obvious question is, why does Jesus get baptized then? Ever ask yourself that question? What was the point of it? What was the objective? What what was the real impetus behind Jesus being baptized? And I would suggest to you this morning that as you look at this passage, and you think about the baptism of Jesus, some would say it was the official entrance onto the world stage. And that is very, very true. Jesus has come out uh, perhaps a year after John, uh, maybe up to a year after John has begun preaching and baptizing, and Jesus is coming onto the world scene. And uh, it's, it's a great event at this point. I don't want you to miss the significance of this. Jesus has been up in Nazareth, Uh, He's been quietly living up there while John's been out in the wilderness, and now John has come on the scene, John is preaching, and now John has made the way straight and prepared the hearts of the people, and now here is Jesus, and he's coming on the world scene. But I don't think that's the reason why Jesus is baptized. Others would suggest that Jesus was identifying with the masses who were repentant, showing the approval of this this mass movement of people who were coming with a repentant spirit. And to a degree, that could be true as he identifies with sinful humanity and he is there to be their savior. But I think the biggest reason that Jesus came and was subjected to baptism by John was to show the approval of God the Father. Now, you'll have to look back at this passage here in Mark to see exactly what I'm talking about. But remember, we're back on the shores of the Jordan River. Are you with me there on the shore? It's a little humid, I know, but we're standing there. And here comes this man, and, you know, I hear what John's saying, so I'm thinking this is pretty interesting. Let's see what happens. Now, up until this point, there's been thousands of people baptized. They go down in the water, they come up out of the water, they sometimes spit, and and, and they hold their nose, and they grab a towel, and they dry off on the shore. I mean, this has happened, and you've watched it over and over and over again. You're there to hear the preaching. You've been baptized yourself. You're listening, and here comes Jesus, and Jesus is going to be baptized, and you're thinking to yourself, okay, he's just like all the rest strangest thing happens. I mean, the strangest thing. The Bible says that when he was baptized, he immediately was coming up out of the water. That's baptism by immersion, by the way. And he saw the heavens opening and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. I can't even tell you what it means to say that the heavens opened. I have no idea. I have no idea what that looked like. Was it a cloudy day and all of a sudden the sky opened up and the sun started shining? Maybe. Uh, Maybe it's something different than that. Maybe it's a real tremendous eye-opening miracle. Maybe there weren't any clouds because it was a sunny day and all of a sudden there were clouds and in the middle of the clouds there was an opening. I don't know. I can't paint the picture for you, but I can tell you that it is not a normal occurrence. Would we agree on that? That there was something that was supernatural that was happening. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit of God is hovering over Jesus, going up and down like a dove. Don't, let's misunderstand anything here. He's not a dove. This isn't an actual white bird that's going up and down. But it is something that is visible. Up until this point, they have never seen any manifestation much of the Holy Spirit of God. 
I received the Holy Spirit and you did too at the moment of salvation. When we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we're baptized into the body of Christ. We receive the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God from that moment on and we are sealed unto the day of redemption. But I want to tell you, I've never seen this Holy Spirit. And you haven't too, so don't come to me afterwards and tell me what he looks like. Here's the reality. They knew something was going on. And as such, they're witnessing this baptism. They're looking, and this, this is all interesting. Look at this. I mean, what is happening? There we are on the banks of the Jordan. We've never seen anything like this. And all of a sudden, from the heavens come the mighty voice of Almighty God. Now that's an attention getter, isn't it? I mean, that is a huge attention getter. Notice what God says. God says in this great voice that comes out of the heavens, you are my beloved son. In you, he says, I am well pleased. If there ever was a certification by God the Father that Jesus Christ is truly the anointed one, the true Messiah, the Son of God, it is this. For out from the heavens comes this enormous voice. Now, the people of Israel up until this point had been going through a spiritually dark time. There weren't times when they were hearing from God. They remember times in the past, like when Moses was out there, and uh, he's, he's, he's there, and the, all of a sudden this bush is on fire, and it's not being consumed, and the voice of God comes to him. It says, take off your shoes. You're standing on holy ground. Now, that must have been a booming voice as well. And the people of Israel, no doubt, talked about the great times in the past when God was moving among the people. There were some mighty miracles that were done. God spoke in different ways to the people of Israel. It was exciting. In fact, during this time when uh, Jesus is coming on the scene, uh, they used to call it the voice of the daughters. And uh, Bath Koel in the Hebrew uh, was a way to explain that God, in his speaking to Israel, he hadn't really stopped speaking to Israel, but he was now speaking to Israel indirectly. Don't you love it? You come up with an excuse. We haven't heard from God in so long. It can't be our sin. It's got to be that God is doing it in an indirect way. And so they came up with the voice of the daughters. Well, you can forget about the voice of the daughters because everybody who's standing there heard the booming voice of Almighty God. And they heard that this one who's just been baptized is his beloved son in whom he is well pleased. God the Father has certified that in truth, Jesus is, as John claimed, the Savior of the world. And here he is. He is on the scene. I would have loved to have been there that day, wouldn't you? With my luck, I'd have been there the day before, and I'd have to leave to go to work. <laughs> I'd have missed all the, 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 the momentous occasion. But can you imagine? I mean, even if you were a Pharisee or a Sadducee who's steeped in their self-righteousness, this was an event, and it might change your mind. It might change your thinking. This was an event, all right. God was saying through the baptism of Jesus, that this is my son in whom I am well pleased, listen to him. Because he has some very, very important things to tell you. So we have the Holy Spirit of God. We have that manifested there. We have the Spirit of God now resting upon uh, Jesus. And uh, Jesus is certified by God the Father that he is truly who he says he is. Second thing happens immediately following this, and it brings us to the second point. Jesus is certified as the sinless Savior of the world. And and we see him certified as the Savior of the world in verse 10, where it says, immediately coming up out of the waters, after seeing the heavens open, the spirit of the dove, a voice come out of the wilderness, immediately the spirit impelled him to go out into the wilderness. So all of this is happening very quickly. Immediately after, the Holy Spirit has come upon Jesus, and the Holy Spirit impels him to go out into this wilderness. There are some uh, Bible translations that will interpret that word or uh, translate that word as driven. He was driven by the Holy Spirit of God out into the wilderness. Why would he do that? He goes out into the wilderness and the Bible says that while he is there, he was in the wilderness for 40 days. 40 days is a long time to be out in the wilderness, wouldn't you agree? That's a long time to be most places. We're out in the wilderness. That's where Jesus ends up. He's out there in the wilderness. 
Now, the Gospel of Mark doesn't tell us anything about the temptation of Christ. Other passages are going to go down through. They're going to enumerate how Jesus was tempted. And Jesus would say, you know, uh, you know Satan, listen, uh, you're not going to get me to fall. You know, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And Jesus would claim the scriptures, and he would be victorious in his walk. Here's one of the things you need to recall. The word Satan means adversary. As Jesus is driven out into the wilderness, the spiritual battle has commenced. And as such, he is being tempted in various ways specifically designed to trip up the Savior of the world. Now, John, or Mark doesn't go into that, but it, what it does tell us is he goes out into the wilderness, and it's out there that these wild animals are ranging around. Now, some people have said, well, you know, it's just wonderful that the wild animals were there. They were there to comfort Jesus. Well, that's not the way I see this passage at all. Uh, these wild animals were a problem. I mean, they would eat Jesus, but the angels of the Lord were ministering to him. Uh, did you see that on the news uh, this morning about the cougar that attacked the guy on the mountain bike? Yeah, started eating on him, and uh, then his friend was on a mountain bike, and he started getting eaten too. I don't know if they both got eaten or... Uh, indigestion befall the cougar, but they did kill a cougar eventually. You see, those wild beasts, there is ministry that's happening. The angels of the Lord are drawing around Jesus. So Jesus is out there in the wilderness. As Jesus is out there in the wilderness, he's being ministered to, he's going through this temptation. It's a horrible period of time. Horrible time in Jesus' early life. And we would know and understand, even though the passage doesn't say it here, that over there in Hebrews, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things. Did you catch that? He is tempted in all things. Listen, he is tempted in all things. Jesus knows the temptations that you and I face. Would you agree with that? He has gone through the temptations that have encompassed all the areas of temptation that you and I face. And as such, he came through with the perfect scorecard. He was tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Jesus the Christ is tempted, and the result is he didn't succumb to sin. Now, it is true that Jesus is human. He could feel the pressure of those temptations. But he is also divine. And as such, he has not received the sin nature that you and I have in our bodies. And so because of that, he is not in danger of sinning. And so his perfection is very significant. Over in Matthew chapter 3, when Jesus goes to John and he says, you need to baptize me so that, he says, all righteousness may be fulfilled. That was important. And so John baptizes him based upon that. Jesus is going to come on the scene. And the question in our mind, as we're standing there on the banks of the Jordan River, the, the question in our mind is, is he truly the Savior of the world? To fulfill all righteousness was an enormous prospect. For we know that the law demands perfection. You had to, if you were going to obey the whole law, be able to obey every single point of the law. Everything. And how many people are sinless and able to obey every aspect of the law? Right? Zip. So here is Jesus, and he's different. And this is why he is qualified to be the savior of the world. It is because he is absolutely without sin. He has fulfilled the requirements of the law. Here's the law saying that, look, if you do this, if you do this, if you do this, make no misunderstanding here. Jesus comes on the scene and he is 100% holy and divine, sinless in every single way. Is that good news? You see, there is a case being made, a certifying that Jesus is truly able to be the Savior of the whole world. And he does that, so showing his sinlessness was absolutely huge. Now, after these two huge events, the Bible goes on to talk about the ministry that Jesus has. 
And this is the preaching ministry of Jesus Christ, where Jesus is truly certified as the source of good news. And we see this in here in verse 14. After John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God. John had been preaching. We know and understand that uh, there is a time uh, where he has been very effective in working on the hearts of human beings, making them receptive to the good news that Jesus would proclaim. But John would lose his life because of his unwavering position against sin. And the king would take his head because he was unrelenting in giving forth the truth. Now, John comes on the scene, followed by Jesus, and now Jesus is going to begin to preach. And he begins to preach, saying that the time has been fulfilled. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is near. There were promises of the Messiah. On and on there were promises. When the fullness of time had come, Messiah would be on the world stage. That has happened. And now the spiritual kingdom is being offered to the people. The kingdom of God is at hand. And yes, Jesus is willing to allow people to come and through a, a spiritual conversion enter into the kingdom of God. It's at hand. The good news. What exactly is that good news or the gospel that literally means good news. If you've translated it out, there is good news because Jesus has died in our place. Jesus has come. He's taken upon himself the sins of the whole world that we might have forgiveness of sin by virtue of faith in him. And Jesus is proclaiming that. I want you to see what else Jesus says. Because Jesus would reiterate the message that John was preaching where he says that he is calling people to repent and believe on the good news. John called people to repent. And what did they need to repent of? If you notice back in Matthew chapter 3, and I'm going to go back there and just read a couple of these verses. Matthew chapter 3, we're reminded of the scenario when the Sadducees and the Pharisees came to John and they wanted to be baptized. And John would say, uh, to them, that basically he says, um, you brood of vipers, he calls them out. And then he says, therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. There was no fruit to demonstrate that their repentance was real. And he says, do not suppose that you can say to yourself, we have Abraham our father. For I say to you that from those stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. You can't say that Abraham and your relationship to him has you spiritually covered. Now, what was the problem? What was the need to repent all about? The problem that they had, put yourself back into the time of those who are standing on the riverbank by the Jordan River. You are a Jew, and you have a spiritual heritage going back to Abraham. And you did not see the need, if you were a Sadducee or a Pharisee, you did not see the need to be baptized, especially with a baptism of repentance, because spiritually there was no need. Their problem was self-righteousness. Self-righteousness. And the problem to a large degree today is still self-righteousness. We are self-righteous oftentimes. You know, when I first moved down here, one of the elders, Dave Cole, he was telling me about Maryland, and he said, uh, Maryland, he says, you come down here, he says, I just want to warn you, he says, they get the worst drivers. <laughs> They're just the worst drivers. Uh, this morning, I was driving to the traffic light. We have a traffic light, with one of those red light cameras in it, you know, and uh, I, you always don't want to get caught, you know, so I'm watching this green arrow from a distance, and I'm gaining on it, and gaining on it, and I know that rascal's going to change to yellow. But I get about uh, 20 feet from the line where you're supposed to stop, and I'm doing about 30 miles an hour, and it turns yellow. And you've got to make it 200 feet and turn the corner, or that thing will nail you. 
It'll nail you every time. And so I put the hammer down, and I goosed it. And I wanted to get around that thing. I don't care if it's two wheels or not. I'm going around that corner, and uh, I'm humming trying to get there. And it was okay. I took my foot off the gas because there's some guy in an SUV about 100 feet behind me, and he's just plowing right on through there. And I'm watching the thing go, flash, flash. <laughs> that's going to cost him $75. And you know how I know that? Well, that's another story. <laughs> Now, be honest with me. Let me just take a little poll here this morning. Be honest with me. How many of you think that Maryland has really bad drivers? Wow. Wow. How many of you would consider yourself to be a really bad driver? I have one and uh, maybe two here this morning, three so everybody raised their hand and thought, Maryland has really bad drivers, but you're not one. <laughs> you see, that's exactly the problem with self-righteousness, isn't it? <laughs> we think to ourselves, now we're fine. It's somebody else's problem. They're messed up, not me. This was exactly the scenario of self-righteousness among the Jewish leaders. They did not see their need for repentance because they were okay. Today, people have to see their need for Jesus as the Savior. They have to see their need for the good news of the gospel in order to be able to look at their heart and realize there needs to be a change. When he mentions repentance, metanoia, to change one's mind, what he was speaking here, I believe, about is the changing of one's mind towards their self-righteousness. There needs to be a release of self-righteousness and a willingness to see ourselves as God sees us. And there's only one way to see yourself, and that's how God sees you. Would you agree? You see, everything else is, is just foolishness. I can try to paint an image of myself. I can try to fool myself. And at times I will try to deceive myself. But all of that is for naught. Because it's only important how God sees me. That's the bottom line, isn't it? We have a huge problem with self-righteousness. In fact, self-righteousness has been a problem for, throughout the ages. And it's no different today than it was way back when. I came across this story, and I'll tell you this story in light of uh, the royal wedding that took place yesterday. How about that, huh? Wasn't that something? I thought I'd get an invitation, but it never came. It must have been that I wasn't home when the certified mail showed up and I needed a sign for it. You know what I mean? But I'm not offended. It's okay. Um, I was busy anyway. Uh, they spent $46 million on that. Is that ridiculous? I mean, I wouldn't have gone a dime over 40 myself. <laughs> Story is told about Lady Huntington. She asked the Duchess of Buckingham to come and hear George Whitfield, great preacher, times past. But the Duchess was not pleased with Whitfield's preaching against sin. She replied, it's a it is monstrous, she said, to be told that you have a heart as sinful as the common wretches that crawl the earth. This is a highly offensive and insulting, and I cannot but wonder that your ladyship should relish any sentiments so much at variance with high rank and good breeding. Excuse me. Woo. Can you imagine actually saying that and then letting somebody write it down? Mercy. But, you know, in all seriousness, you and I struggle with self-righteousness. It'll be self-righteousness that take hordes and hordes of people to hell. People will spend eternity in hell because they never saw themselves as God sees them. There is none righteous, no, not one. The Bible is very clear on that. The preaching of Jesus Christ was designed to call sinners to repentance, to throw off their self-righteousness, realize their need of of a savior and embrace Jesus the Christ. You and I, as we look at our lives, there are things for us to think about. Have you answered Jesus' call to repent and believe on him, believe on the good news, that he is the only way for you to gain entrance into the kingdom of God? Have you publicly identified with the movement of Jesus Christ by being baptized by immersion in the name of Jesus Christ? Are you a true follower of his? Those are big questions. Those are tall questions for us to ask ourselves. Truly, Jesus is certified as the Son of God. 
God the Father has declared it with a booming voice from the heavens. The Holy Spirit has demonstrated that. He's passed the test out there in the wilderness. He truly is the sinless Savior. He has fulfilled righteousness. And he calls on you today to put your faith in him. Would you be willing to do that? Let's bow our heads before the Lord this morning. You may be here today and you're not certain of where you'll spend your eternity. I wouldn't be ashamed of admitting that at any point in time. The reality is that there is no one who comes into the world who has already come to Christ. Every single one of us finds ourselves entering into this world in need of the Savior. But there needs to be an understanding that we have that need. And maybe you're here this morning and God is speaking to your heart about the need to place faith in Christ. If God's at work in your heart today and I can pray for you, I'd love to do that. Now there's folks that'll be here at the front after the service. If you have questions about your faith or where you're going to spend your eternity, maybe you want to talk to somebody and get information about baptism, whatever it might be, they'll be here for that. But I wonder this morning if I can pray for you. God speaking to your heart. Say, Pastor Kevin, pray for me. I'm convicted about placing my faith in Christ. Whatever it might be that God's working in your heart on this morning. Is there anyone that I can pray for? Just slip up your hand. Love to pray for you today. Happy to do that. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me, please, as we have a word of prayer? Father in heaven, I thank you for giving to us life in Christ. I thank you, Father, for the sacrifice that you made to come to this place and die in our, our stead. How thankful we are today that we can place our faith in Jesus Christ and know that our sins are forgiven. Work in these hearts, I pray, today. Help them to have assurance that they are truly receiving the gift of salvation through, through faith in Christ alone. Be with others, Lord, who have asked for prayer today because you're at work in their heart in a different way. Work in lives today, I pray. Receive the glory. And again, Father, we thank you for Jesus and what he means to us. May we glorify our Savior this week as we go from this place. May we bring you joy, Lord, I pray in Christ's name. Amen.